This video lesson looks at the internal energy of an object. It connects temperature to the motion of particles and looks at how heat flows from a hot object to a cold object. Let's have a look at the most common states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. So here we have a solid, and a solid's made up of particles, and those particles are arranged in a very structured uh, manner uh, called a crystal lattice. It's the attractive forces between particles that holds the solid together. Move one particle and the adjacent particles get tugged and pulled. It's the strong attraction between particles of a solid that give the solid its fixed shape and volume. A liquid too is made up of particles and its particles are attracted to one another, but not as strongly as a solid. Turn a glass of water on its side and its particles rotate about each other to form a new surface parallel to the ground. We can see its shape can change but its volume stays the same. Here we have a gas contained in a vessel uh, with a valve between the two chambers. Gas particles are in blue and there's a very weak if not zero attractive force between gas molecules and that gives them the ability to move or translate uh, inside the chamber. So you can see the red arrow showing the gas molecules are moving in a random motion. Open up the valve and the gas diffuses to the other chamber. The volume of the gas is increased. In fact, the volume of a gas is simply the volume of the container that contains it. And gases have no fixed shape and volume. Let's examine the motion of the particles. We saw that in the solid, which has the strongest attractive forces, particles in the solid have the least ability or the, the lowest freedom to move. Solid particles can only vibrate, whereas liquid particles can vibrate and rotate. And that's what gave the liquid's ability to change its surface when you rotated the glass of water. With the absence of an attractive force between particles in a gas, the particles are now able to translate or move freely. In this simulation, we're looking at a solid block of neon and so you can see the motion of the neon particles. They're vibrating back and forth. This is at a very low temperature, 13 Kelvin. Uh, more on the Kelvin scale later, but uh, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Now here's oxygen solid at 31 Kelvin. Again, vibration of the particles. And water in its solid form at 157 Kelvin. Again, able to vibrate but not rotate nor translate. Let's have a look at the liquids. So here we're looking at liquid neon, and you can see that the particles are able to rotate about each other. In fact, this liquid surface should extend uh, horizontally right across the, the cylinder here. You'll also notice that the odd particle of neon has uh, just enough energy to escape the liquid, and those are the gas particles that you see. So here we have oxygen, and liquid water and then gases so now particles so far apart there's for all intents and purposes there's zero attractive force between them and this is gaseous water again able to translate rotate and of course vibrate and they bounce off container walls back to the solid solid water, vibrating only, liquid water, able to rotate and vibrate, and gas translate as well. What happens when you bring a hot object near a cold object? So here we have a hot solid and a cooler liquid. So let's drop the hot solid into the cold liquid. The particles of the hot solid actually come in contact with the particles of the cold liquid at the surface and they bang into each other much like the cart collisions we examined in the mechanics unit. 
Hot, fast-moving red particle slows down. Slow-moving cold particle blue speeds up. Eventually, these objects will come to the same temperature called thermal equilibrium. But what is temperature? It's simply the measurement of, or measure of, the motion of the particles in the object. Since the faster moving particles slow down and the slower moving particles speed up, heat, thermal energy, flows from the hot object to the cold object. Consider the example where we're pushing a box along the ground. It goes or displaces a, a displacement S and we're pushing it with constant force F. If the box moves at constant velocity, we know there must be an equal and opposite force, the force of friction in this case, opposing the applied force. Well, we know the box is moving and therefore it has kinetic energy, bulk kinetic energy, but we also know that the particles that make up the box are moving. So we look at something called the internal energy, which considers the energy of the particles that make up the object. So the internal energy of the box is the sum of the average kinetic energy of the box's particles. And we have to add on the molecular potential energy. And that has to do with the arrangement of the particles that make up the box. Let's have a closer look at molecular potential energy, also called intermolecular potential energy. So imagine uh, holding a ball above the ground. Uh, how high I hold it above the ground will dictate how much gravitational potential energy is stored in the ball. Raise the ball to a new position, position two, and its gravitational potential energy increases. In fact, the distance between the ball and the Earth uh, dictates the gravitational potential energy. The greater the distance, the greater the potential energy. This is very much the same story at the particle level. There's an attractive force between particles, and you can think of it as a spring, an imaginary spring between particles. As you stretch those particles apart, there's more and more energy stored in that spring. To get those particles farther apart, you have to apply a force through a displacement. You have to do work on the particles. And that's why the potential energy in the particle arrangement increases. So in general, solid particles will have less intermolecular potential energy than liquid particles and less yet than gas particles. And that's because work is being done to separate the particles. Back to our boy pushing box example. The boy's obviously doing work pushing the box across the floor. The bulk kinetic energy of the box is not changing. It's moving at constant velocity. Where does that energy go? He's doing work on the box. Well, he's changing the internal energy of the box and the ground. You know, we're talking friction here. In this simulation, the box is the chemistry text and the ground is the physics text. And so when they rub together, particles bounce into each other and they cause that vibration motion to increase and increase as we push the box along the ground. Temperature rises and the work is going into increasing the internal energy of both. The spacing of the particles is not changing, so the intermolecular potential energy doesn't change. But what is changing is the average kinetic energy of the particles. They increase, increase in the temperature, and now they're decreasing as they both cool off. Let's review the main points of this video lesson. Uh, one, that objects have energy within the particles that, that uh, comprise them. So we talk about the internal energy of an object being the sum of the average or mean kinetic energy of its particles plus the intermolecular potential energy of its particles, all about the arrangement of the particles within the object. The second point, when we talk about the temperature of an object, we're really measuring uh, the motion of its particles. So temperature on a temperature scale called the Kelvin scale, and we'll look at that later, is directly proportional to the average uh, or mean kinetic energy of the particles. And lastly, that heat flows from a hot object to a cold object. All right, let's try a practice problem. 
question goes like this, which one of the following is not correct when explaining what happens when a hot object X comes into contact with colder object Y? And we have four choices. Let's try this question. Pause your viewer. Pause your viewer now. We know as the particles come in contact that the faster moving, hotter particles X will slow down and Y's particles will speed up. So answers A and B check out still searching for which one is not correct. Thermal energy or heat energy flows from hot to cold, so from X to Y. Answer D checks out. At thermal equilibrium, the average kinetic energies of the particles are equal, but in general the particles won't have the same mass. If the mass of X's particles is different than the mass of Y's particles, then the speeds of x must be different than the speeds of y, so that ek equals one-half mass times speed squared are the same for x and y particles. Okay, question number two. Uh, which one of the following statements, again, is not correct concerning the warming of a block of iron from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius? And here are your four options, looking for which one is not correct. Pause your viewers and try this question. Well, you're definitely increasing the internal energy of the iron block as you warm it up. And the iron particles will vibrate more, so B and C are correct. Remember that your temperature in Kelvin is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles. So if you're doubling your temperature, this doubling of temperature is in degrees Celsius. So answer A is actually not correct because uh, the average kinetic energy of the iron particles is not going to be doubled simply because your doubling here is in degrees Celsius, not Kelvin. Let's see why D is also correct. Um, there is no change in spacing of the particles. You're not... Um, you're not melting the iron, you're not increasing the particle spacing. So the, the molecular potential energy of, of the particles in the block also stays constant, does not change. D is also correct. Answer is A.